So actually, I have a question. So the function table is really useful for human readability. Is there a reason you can't force whatever compiler or whatever structure to treat them as basically inline functions? And so effectively we sort of back down to a switch table or something. It, yeah, it, it's actually a little frustrating to me that like if I write a big series of if statements, performance is bad because it's going to do a bunch of branches. If I write a switch, the compiler, I mean, some compilers may choose to make a series of if statements or choose to make the jump table. I would prefer the jump table, but uh, there's, uh, there's no way to like force it to do a jump table. And you can do tables, but they, they only, I mean, the, the only way to have a table is to have a table of functions. And then functions, you're paying the overhead of doing the function pointers. Uh, some language actually supports directly like a table of code fragments. That would be nice. Well, but I mean, the thing is, is like, uh, so like there's the inline uh, command that you can put in front of a function. Mm. But it insists every time it attempts to call the function, instead it injects the code in line. Yeah, it, um, do it doesn't work with function pointers, though. Obviously. But I mean, yeah. it seems like something that, like, because it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's very much a human like use thing. It's made to make the yeah. humans happy. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I, I do kind of get the impression that there's there's a lot of room sort of in designing languages where you could make this kind of thing both expressive and efficient if it was just the the right language. I, I yeah. I mean, it, it's frustrating because the, there's there are some really amazingly sophisticated, beautiful uh, uh, languages, but they tend not to be high performance. And uh, having so, I mean, the the goal, uh, is sort of the, my goal in life, is to have uh, uh, awesome, amazing performance, including parallelism, uh, th things like multi-core, but also to get like just very expressive, very natural way to write the code. Uh, in particular, getting the parallelism out of people's faces would be really nice. Ah. So we, we, we saw this last time, essentially, that if, I, if I'm parsing strings as the code runs, that it takes literally hundreds of times longer than uh, if you're not parsing strings and you're basically just uh, do, doing a big switch. In particular, a big, big switch seemed to be the fastest way to do it, which is actually a little bit surprising, uh, that the, the compiler is willing and able to stick in a jump table to, uh, to make the switch statement be one unpredictable dispatch. And then everything else is just super duper, like as as fast as uh, as, as straight line code, uh, which is cool. The question is how how can you get faster than this? Because actually, two nanoseconds per, uh, you know, uh, operation, that's that's good, but it's not nearly as good as an actual hardware. You know, the actual uh, compiled code would be faster. There's a there's a great trick that I I don't see people do enough. Compilers are fast. Uh, you know, freely licensed, run the compiler. So, f for example, I, I, I could imagine a situation where I, uh, I get some source code in some strange language. I could, com I could compile that code to C, uh, run the C compiler to make a shared library, link the shared library into my program, run the shared library, and actually I might be able to do that in like a few milliseconds. Especially if I can keep the headers uh, uh, short on my generated code. So, so in, in particular, if you want to generate, and the advantage of this would be then the code is really compiled C code, and that's as fast as anything is going to get on your machine. Why? Why doesn't that happen? This is not rhetorical. I don't know why people don't do this. I have a shell script. Let's, let's see if it actually works. Uh, called the C interpreter. Th this was pre netrun. I end up using netrun for this. I mean, essentially, net netrun is almost like this. So C, C interpreter. So I can do like printf. Let's see. Getting the quoting right is a little bit tricky from the command line. Uh, so percent o eight x. Uh, so if I want to convert uh, uh, one two three four five into hex, I can do that. And okay, there's a little delay. That, oh, there's a perceptible delay. Maybe this is why they don't do this. It, it's this. Uh, it's it's basically assembling a little. Uh, so it's. I think it's a shell script. So hopefully this will work. Yeah. So it uh, it basically makes just exactly net run style. It it uh, drops on some headers. You have some file scope stuff to do. It does that. It run, oh, this is oh I, I, I didn't compile it as uh, it's C plus plus. This is sort of the problem here. 
it's including like 20,000 lines of C++ headers is, the, is why there's a perceptible delay. So all it does is it compiles it into an executable, checks to see if it worked, and then just runs the executable and then deletes the executable in the source code because they were just created on the fly and then uh, removed. Does that make sense? It, it, it is slow. So if, if you let the headers get out of control, the problem is, uh, yeah, that this is where if the compiler would, if I could like save the compiler state right here, this would make this end net run substantially faster. The problem is, is like <coughs> to trim down the libraries, you need to know what you're using. What kind of so, so, so typically in this, in this sort of situation, you would be using uh, uh, just the stuff in your language. So if, if I was trying, so I was trying to run Python fast, right? Uh, I would basically include my Python library, right? The interpreter front uh, facing stuff. And then that's the, that's the only thing that I'm going to be generating for this compiled uh, version of the so words, I'd read the Python, I'd write the C code, I'd compile the C code and then run it, which would basically do the stuff that the Python was telling you to do. Yeah. Honestly, that's better than monkeying around with machine code directly. <laughs> Just do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, and uh, it's uh, this somehow so this, this, to me somehow this this uh, this implies that uh, in the NP completeness, right? Sat did the hard work of taking an honest goodness Turing machine and getting into something we can deal with. So here, if you use C plus plus as the same sort of middle layer of I, I, I solve some arbitrary problem, I end up making C plus plus, and heck, I've got the C plus compiler. That uh, that then then spits out you know nice fast code and I can run that uh, efficiently. Uh, yeah, if if you want to, to if the C so, so uh, compilers are big and they're not optimized for this sort of thing. Actually, probably you should just optimize the compiler for that sort of thing if, uh, if you really want to do that. Uh, is it possible to spit up machine code directly? This would let you do uh, this on like a millisecond time scale instead of or a, a microsecond time scale. I mean, it, running a compiler, it compiles a big program. It's going to take milliseconds, I think. I don't know. How, how fast are compilers? Other question. Uh, so to compile an empty C program, it's totally empty. I'm just going to run GCC. Uh, empty. I, I guess I have to l linking it is going to be the, uh, the bottleneck here. So GCC empty. It, it, of course, uh, it should. As a single subpart, right? Okay. So th that that looked pretty quick. Okay, that took 16 milliseconds. Yeah. So you're still in the milliseconds just to load the compiler up. Actually, it probably runs the preprocessor. You, you could probably strip out a bunch of stuff here. Preprocessor, you just do the preprocessing yourself. Uh, yeah. I'm curious if it's actually worse with G++. Probably not. Actually, because it sees the dot C is probably not even willing to compile it as C++. So, uh, running compiler is a fairly heavyweight operation. I guess you could imagine a machine like a cell phone. No compiler available. But you, you, you can still generate machine code. That's the, uh, that, that's, that's the weird part about this. So how on earth do you generate machine code? Well, conceptually it's straightforward. <laughs> like, there's some bytes that make your machine run, right? You just Put those bytes somewhere that's runnable, and then you can run them. So, so this is the the, uh, the the hardest part about this is the syntax in C or C plus plus for function pointers looks really weird. So that's defining a type named funky t, and uh, it it returns long and it takes void. That's the argument basically. So. Right. That's the return type of the function, that's the argument list for the function, and then this is making it be a function pointer. And I, I agree, this is the weirdest looking syntax almost imaginable. So uh, f f funky t, if I do a type cast from a pointer to a long <laughs> to be a pointer to a function, then I can run it, which is weird. So. Why is this run uh, as a a? So, but if we do this in theory, like, do you have to return long there? You can't return anything else. Ah, uh, it, it it's 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 only it's whatever you want this thing to be. So if I if I say it returns double, 
I, it doesn't really work as a double. Whatever that is, that's not okay, a double. It it, yeah, you can lie and say it returns a standard string, and then it's going to try and run the destructor on an int and uh, evil things. Uh, do I? Oh, I'm compiling as plain C apparently. Uh, right. So if, if if I claim it returns a string, oh, you can't return a string. Sure. So, yeah. Uh, but but it, uh, when I call it, it's like, oh yeah, you, it's, it's a string is coming out of that thing. Uh, so yeah, you you have to get this correct, or ha has to somehow match up with whatever uh, uh, madness that you're that you're actually doing. What what is this madness? In particular, what how does that get stored as bytes in memory? Those those are the three bytes. What what order are they stored in? It's the opposite order of what I see up there, isn't it? It's, it's, it's so this is a little endian machine, meaning the first byte is on the little end of the int. It's the bo. So uh, bo is the opcode. Aa is the, uh, the the input. That's so bo is actually a uh, it loads an eight byte constant an eight, eight bit constant into uh, the low eight bits of a, R A X. And uh, so load AA, and then C3 uh, is, is just a return. If you have nothing but a, a C3, this will return, but not it won't return. If we happen to have zero, that's, uh, that's handy. Uh, if, if you put in something like foof, that, uh, that's not good. That's, yeah, that's bad news. Don't get bad memory. Yeah, apparently. Should put a question mark on this. Actually, so th these are all net runs, signal handlers, and I try to sort of suggest how you might have gotten this wrong. This is this is not uh, it's not easy to, to like explain what you did wrong. <laughs> the int that you're running as machine code is not good machine code. So yeah, uh, th there's th th there's a bunch of options here. So uh, I don't expect anyone else to uh, know how to do this. But if you load a, uh, you can load a 32-bit constant. A A B B C C D D. Uh, B8 loads a 32-bit constant. If I'm remembering correctly, uh, right. So D D is the low byte, and it uh, th there. It is. So that got loaded into the return address register, which is register zero R A X. This is a weird way to write stuff. I mean, weirder than we're used to. Yeah, doing it backwards is, is uh, arguably almost the worst part here. So let's do a const carrier pointer. So you see this a lot uh, in, in stuff called shellcode. So the problem is I need binary data in the string. The nice part about strings is strings, like if I have the letters A, B, and C in a string, A is at the lowest address, B is at the next higher address, C is at the next higher address. So it's not like backwards like ints. And you can make strings arbitrarily long, whereas uh, here, if, we, if I have more than eight bytes, it'll say, like, your number is too big to fit in a long, <laughs> which is uh, a, a pain. I, I, but uh, there's a great, uh, th there's a string that keeps coming up, uh, avawatu or something. It, uh, there, there's ASCII. The, it, it, this is like push R15, R14, R13, R, uh, it, it turns out that, that if you run strings on a 64-bit program, uh, so strings ls, you get uh, none on this. Uh, th th some, somewhere, uh, I think it's Windows programs or something. I, I keep seeing that. I've seen this a lot. Like, like what, what is that? Is, it, is that the author's initials or something? But, uh, yeah, uh, so I, I don't want to write this in ASCII. ASCII is going to come out as bytes. They're not the bytes that I want. So I, I, I'd like to enter these things in hex, so in particular like a hex B8. So I'm just going to use a hex escape sequence. So uh, B, B8 loads, let me do a B0, loads a constant, then, I don't know, the constant is 22, and then uh, uh, let's see, uh, the, uh, uh, C3 for the return. So hopefully that is return to hex 22. No, that's like false. Because why? Is this string really? Uh, I, 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 I want to see if the right bytes ended up in memory. Oh no, it's still th it's, it is three bytes. Oh, ah, this is this is ridiculous. For some reason, a string is already a pointer. 
So I don't need to take the address of the string. That runs the address of the string as as machine code, which is not what I wanted. So that uh, so, so this is running the bytes of the string as machine code. So that's that's 22. You see a lot of uh, uh, shell code. It's called because if you want to buffer overflow uh, something, your data is going to the far side as a string. So uh, typically you write the code to pop a shell or to do whatever work you want to do uh, as a string. It's a handy way to do it. Ah. Uh, this seems like going to be something that you'd like have a security program being like, are you trying, you, does your program look like it has just direct code? Actually, like for, for, for the longest time, uh, you uh, uh, oftentimes the uh, getting the location where you're trying to jump to is like the hardest part about uh, writing shell code. So they usually used a NOP sled, NOP, uh, so it has a bunch of no ops. So if you land anywhere in the, so if you can execute code anywhere in the big pile of no ops, it'll just keep no, no oping along until it hits your actual payload. So it, it lets you have a giant like, uh, uh, you know, uh, target area. And as long as you can get execution to land anywhere in there, then it'll just uh, s slide on through the nops. Now the standard nop was hex 90. That's uh, that is a, 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 a no operation tool. And uh, at some point, firewalls are just like, you know what, if I see a bunch of packets with hex 90s coming in, it's probably, it's a trap. Just uh, so if I run code 90 and then return, that should do nothing. Uh, disassemble it. It is assembly. Now, the hard part about this is that we're, <laughs> we're writing one level below assembly. So uh, hex 90 was sort of widely uh, 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 firewalled off as saying, like, if I see a ton of 90s going through, I don't care what service it's for, it's probably bad. Uh, it, uh, it, and of course, the, the, the countermeasure for that was that uh, the, uh, the Metasploit NOP sled generator makes, like, if you want ASCII text that uh, when you run it doesn't crash, that's all you care about. Like, it'll just, like, run. Not crash. It, it'll it'll totally generate ASCII text that does not crash. Like you can you can just say what constraints you want, and it'll be totally unique. It can be regenerated every time, so it's not like the same signature. Uh, yeah, bad news. Ah, so uh, again, ret is C3. Let me write uh, what we've actually been doing here. So this is move AL like 22. This should be B022. I only remember this because I keep doing this example. <laughs> So B0 loads into the A register in 8-bit constant, and the B8 one was uh, to, uh, EAX. It load up a 4-byte constant into EAX. So that's a B8, there's the constant. So these bytes, sitting in memory and runnable, basically lets you run, lets you make up machine code and then run it, which is cool. Ah, uh, now there's, there's one problem here. So you notice that I made this a const static. I mean, this, this, these are kind of a weird way to declare uh, some code. If I make this care pointer, the compiler actually whines about saying, hey, wait a sec, it's a string constant. You don't want it to be a care pointer. But then it, it runs it anyway. This is actually read-only memory. If, if you go in and you try and change the code, so for example, if I'm going to say code of, oh my gosh, instead of returning 22, if I want to return a different number, uh, so I'm going to return 11, hex 11. Ah, the write is actually going to crash, which is a little weird. It's not the running of it. I, I can, I can uh, basically just write the thing and return 3. It doesn't get to return 3. It crashes. And, and it crashes when we do the write. Strings are unmodifiable. That's the idea. I declare a string. By default, it's stored in read-only memory. The read-only memory on x86 is... So, uh, there's this principle, W XOR X. So uh, this is read only, which uh, makes it uh, actually be executable. Because the, so W XOR X, the, the, the general principle is that uh, you should either be able to write to it or execute it. The problem is if you can write to it and execute it at the same time, then somebody can change the code. As it, as it's running before it's running, that's that's a security uh, flaw. Yeah. Well, they make a byte array. Ah, there's no easy way to do this. Which is so so uh, yeah yeah. If 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 I want to make something that can be modified, like uh, lots of ways to do this, like a standard string. So here's my code. This is cool. So so uh, I should be able to modify the code uh, equals x11. So just to see if that part worked. 
So, no. Uh, so now, now I have to do something special down here. This doesn't run yet. Uh, so I, I want to run the actual code. So okay, so you can modify a standard string. Good, that makes sense. Let's. So this is the same bytes. Uh, this this doesn't work. This is weird. Uh, so, so this is actually crashing when we run the function. And, and it crashes because of the WXRX principle, that, uh, that this is now writable memory, which means it is not executable memory. And that's annoying. But then it means I can't casually make up functions <laughs> on the fly. Sounds like totally useful. This is like blocking my freedom. Uh, Unless I, make, I tell my program to make a new file that has the new function in it. Now, it, it, so it turns out you do not have to, so uh, WXRX is a recommended strategy and uh, normal programs are compiled in a WXRX mode where essentially like they get some errors they can write to the stack or the heap or you know, where your variables are and some errors that are read only and hence executable like the code. But you can ask for anything you want. So for example, I can do an mprotect call and this is, this is hiding in some weird header that uh, and so this is in sysmman.h. It's the same place as mmap. So I, I think I have to graduate out to a full-on function to do this. So we need... Uh, oh, can I block... To, okay, I can block indent still. Good. Uh, so I, I, I want to call mprotect, and I, I want to just change the, the permissions on this code to make it do the right thing. So I have an address, a size, and a protection. And I can just say, let me read it, write it, and execute it, all three. Or I guess in this case, all I need is basically read and execute. So I'm going to take the code, the code dot uh, size, and I'm going to uh, put in code read. So uh, hopefully, having done this, we will now have executable code. Uh, bitwise or is maybe smarter. Yeah. Um, still crashes. Actually, mprotect returns a value. I should make sure it worked. It, actually, my suspicion is it did not work. If on success it returns zero, on error it returns negative one. Okay. So if I don't get a zero back. Something went wrong, so I'm just gonna. And I, I think mprotect is gonna give me an error, hopefully. Yeah, uh, invalid argument. What? What's invalid? Well, uh. That's annoying. So this is fancy, wacky memory manipulation stuff. Memory permissions uh, are done at the hardware level in granular in a big granularity, 40, 96 bytes, one page. Do you remember this? They covered this in 321. Did I cover this in 301? I remember. Touched on it. Yep. So, uh, hmm, well, how do we, so what I need to do is now, I guess, uh, round this down. If I make it read, write, or exec, then that, uh, so, so, so if, if, if I'm only touching my code, right, and if, if I'm just changing this area, then I make it executable and not modifiable. That's cool, because I don't, you know, uh, I, I'm not going to be breaking anything else by doing that. If, if I'm going to have to round up, so in other words, this code is actually living in the middle of the heap somewhere. So I have these three bytes that I want to change. Uh, but I have to round the end down, I have to basically round up, and then get this whole area. Unfortunately, I have no idea what's before and after my stuff. It's uh, all... Uh, 
that's that's all standard strings uh, to domain there so don't really know what exactly is is in there so I so I, I you want right to write permission so this is uh, a little annoying so how about I uh, round down and then I'm, I'm just gonna cheat here and uh, instead of code that size I'm gonna do 4096 or heck, like four pages worth because uh, I don't know I don't know how big that has to be so now I just need to write a function that will round a pointer down to a page there may be something built in that does this but I I don't know what it is yet so uh, I, I take a source pointer how do you how do you do this round down to the next multiple of 4096 <laughs> Lots of ways to do this. Yeah. So the big problem is you can't you can't literally do anything in a void pointer. You can't dereference it. You can't even do arithmetic on it. Like you got to typecast it something. So I'm I'm just going to make it an unsigned long. So this is my uh, integer version of the pointer. That that be that be cool. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So actually, let me do I pointer. Uh, that that sounds like the most uh, justifiable. So this is the unaligned part. So I'm I'm gonna just do mod the page size. I just know the page size in this machine is 1496. There's some somewhere there's a macro or something you can. Uh, they don't say how big pages are. As I recall, it's actually uh, it's, it's kind of hard to do that portably. So uh, I, all I want is I, I want to basically take the pointer. And I'm going to move it down by the unaligned bits. So essentially, the uh, if it, the thing is if it ended in like four five six, I want it to end in zero zero zero. It turns out forty ninety six is uh, in in hex. That's uh, one zero zero zero. So the low three bits uh, or the low three hex digits ought to be zero. Let's see. So we've just changed I pointer. Let me make it back into a void pointer. And if we've done this correctly, this will all just magically work. Let's see if that magically works. Oh, I pointer is used uninitialized. Oh, typecast it from pointer. That would have been good. So uh, right. And then M protect says you cannot allocate that memory. It's not letting me make uh, this area executable. I cannot allocate okay, memory. I can. The uh, Linux has actually been getting a lot more persnickety about this stuff. Uh, you're, you're not allowed to do that. Yeah. What are you trying? That's the. Uh, <clears throat> so I I think I actually so I might need so I I I'm not sure where this code is stored. It's actually likely to be on the stack, so let me let me just uh, see see where it is. So, uh, old pointer. Uh, so if that's got a bunch of Fs in front of it, then I think that's yeah, that's on the stack. Uh, the the stack I would bet you is probably marked where the kernel's like you can't make the stack executable. Don't even let him try. Too dangerous. So, hmm. I might be able to do it if I just move it out in the global data area. So globals are stored in a different location. Pointer is totally different. Uh, ha! Take that, compiler. Uh, th th this is only going to work for a certain length of time. Eventually, it'll uh, uh, get get too clever for us. Actually, at some point, they're going to lock down M protect. But like, uh, I'm not even root, right? And I can say like, oh yeah, this these bytes and or these pages in memory ought to be executable. Sure. No way that could go wrong. <clears throat> I guess you're running code already. It's not like not running code is, is a thing here. Uh, so we, uh, uh, so, so you know, uh, when I moved the location where code was allocated, I changed the memory that it got allocated to, and uh, apparently the global data area still lets you just do old school. It, it used to be there was no memory that was not readable, writable, executable. In the DOS era, it was all just this open, unclaimed forest. And then eventually it's been logged and hemmed in and roads built across it. And then, 
Yep. So, uh, n notice what we finally did. If <laughs> it's still obvious, we had some machine code. We changed it. We made it executable, and that was it. Then we could run it. Uh, c cool thing about this is uh, this is actually it's pretty fast once. Uh, So the, the running of specially modified code like this is actually relatively fast. This looks horribly slow. It took like 300 nanoseconds to do basically like, like all of this. Most of it's in the M protect, which is annoying. So you know what I'm going to do is uh, something even eviler here. Uh, I want code to run one time at startup. So I'll have the run once code. The run once code's constructor is going to fix uh, the memory access on our code. It's going to do that. And uh, and then I then I make the run once here. So that's declaring an object of type run once. Actually probably probably uh, less scary if I say run once. So declares a object of type run once because it's global. The constructor is going to run at startup. Hopefully the code is going to be there. That may or may not work. Let's see if it works. Constructor certainly can't return a value. Okay, why? Uh, that's wacky. So I claim this function is really just a two instruction assembly function. Uh, my timing is crazy slow. Why? I mean, I'm writing one byte to a string. That's fast. So if I don't run the function, it's fast. Right? That's uh, one nanosecond. It's as fast as it gets. Uh, if I define this crazy function, but I do not modify it, I claim that should also be fast. Yep, uh, I have one function call overhead in there because I do have to call f. But if I have a one nanosecond change and a two nanosecond run, combined they t take 90 nanoseconds. Why is this? Is it because you're now accessing change memory and it's like having to do all code verifications? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the CPU has an instruction cache and has a separate data cache. The instruction cache is used to cache instructions. The data cache is used to cache data. This crosses the streams. This ends reality as we know it, right? This, uh, this is a data cache write that then the, the very rarely used circuit that goes through and says like, uh, does this data cache write blow away something in the instruction cache? Actually says yes. Then the whole CPU is like, whoa. Um. <laughs> in particular, this is the time that it takes for the CPU to reload the instruction cache and then to re. So, so the instruction cache is like the raw x86 code in memory, and then has to re-decode that stuff, and then has to refill the pipeline and like all the like. Th this this like ends uh, modern CPUism. Like self-modifying code is not high performance on uh, uh, most of these machines. So in particular, it, I, I guess uh, you don't want code that's changing itself instruction by instruction. Yeah. If you change a lot of instructions all at once, though, it yep. reloads just the same, right? Yeah. So so you're paying a 90 nanosecond uh, flush cost per okay. modification. So every time you compile your new script, costing 90 nanoseconds, like that's the negligible. It costs you another 200. It, it costs you way more than that just to load the thing from disk, so or, or network or wherever you've got it. Go. Oh. And what is it returning? Oh, I, I think that is the 11, and I think this is the garbage in the high bytes of uh, RAX. So. Uh, yeah, so let me load a full constant. So if, if, if I load B8, 
Then that's uh, 22, and then the zeros. zeros. I'll put FFs in the high. So four bytes get loaded in, hopefully. And now th these are sort of backwards. That's the lowest byte. That's the highest byte. So we should have FFs in the high bytes. What, what, what did I do wrong here? This is not easy code to debug, FYI. I have four bytes that I've loaded as my constant. B8 loads a four byte constant. What precisely was the, let's see. Oh, signal raised to address 11. Should not be accessing address 11. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's try it without the modification on. Yeah. Because uh. we're debugging the. Still dies. Now it's at address 22. Uh, am, am I am I not remembering B8 correctly? I thought, I thought we just did B8. Yep, that's a B8. I guess, the, uh, so here, here's how I will often find the bytes for this stuff. Let me XOR EAX against EAX. That zeroes out EAX and then move into ALO uh, 22. Okay, so we have uh, 31 C0 and then BO 22. It's possible my slash X is not doing what I want it to. Okay, so now uh, the 22 is of uh, 0, 1, 2, 3 bytes in when, when we run it. So ho hopefully this should zero it out. Yes, that works fine. So we're returning a 22. And then uh, if I overwrite the code, it, it's slower, but uh, we return the, the right thing now. Uh, yep. Questions? Is this worth it? I, I agree. Kind of a good question. It's hopefully hard to convince you to go well, to assembly. Well, even. Um, this works on any x86 machine. Yeah. You can't. You yeah. Uh, there's a huge portability penalty for this. Uh, this uh, so uh, this is the only way to get JavaScript, for example, to run basically in uh, full-on performance. So let's see. So so unconvincing. Let's uh, l l l let me show you the code to actually do. So so l last time I had this little interpreter with like uh, you know we had uh, move and add and count and loop with these simple little instructions. So if I move. So I load a three, I add, I return. If if I have somewhere I have the, the the state of the interpreter and I've got the different registers there and fields of this little struct, and then I write functions that operate on you know the, the operands and the uh, the fields of the struct, then essentially all I need is I I need the ability to take these the, the body of each of these functions and then stick them together. And, and the bodies of these functions are actually really simple. So if, if you look at uh, so if, if, you, if you look at the disassembly here, like I have a bunch of uh, you know B basically loads. Right? So I'm going to load load a constant. So there, that's a BF to load it into RDI, and then the body of the uh, the code to uh, to do that. So let's see. So if, if you look at the disassembly for these things, like run move, right? RSI is the pointer to the interpreter. RDI is the uh, the value we're passing in. So these three bytes basically, you know, reinitialize the uh, the accumulator. These three bytes, and you know, it's the only difference is that uh, the operation we're doing instead of a move, you do an add. So different three bytes, and now we're doing arithmetic on the accumulator. Uh, we we can move stuff into the count, so that's uh, that's a variant, the move variant that takes an offset. 
we can uh, loop looks a little scarier, but uh, if, if you think like, okay, I got uh, you know move add count, actually something like a return, uh, it's pr pretty easy to do. So it, it, you could you could actually imagine saying, well, okay, I'm gonna have uh, my function pointers, and I'm gonna remember how many bytes are actually getting stuff done in that function before the return. So then you can actually, so, so it's, it's really not that much code to do this, right? So I'm, I'm basically going to loop over my source. I'm going to figure out what operand I'm supposed to execute. Uh, if, it's, uh, if it's something I can't handle yet, you just uh, push a return opcode. And otherwise, I basically make a move. So I'm going to make a BF. So, so this is a load end RDI. And then I'm going to uh, just push back. Uh, so I'm, I'm just building up this string that has all the bytes. And then at the end, hopefully, there's a C3. So just, you know, I'm going to print the machine code, uh, hopefully. Uh, so th this, this actually welds itself into machine code. So hopefully, you can read along with me here. So that's loading a constant into RDI. That's doing a move, I think. Load a different constant into RDI. Do an add and do a return. Don't need no disassembler. Read machine code. It's fun. Ah, when you run it, so, so uh, I mean, so this totally thing. This, it's actually built this machine code to follow the uh, the the code that we wrote here. And uh, Chrome is doing this to make JavaScript run fast. The V8 interpreter. It, it literally sticks together a new chunk of machine code to do the stuff that your JavaScript was doing, but as fast as it can possibly get. How fast is it if you do this correctly? You have written a compiler, <laughs> right? In other words, if, if, if the machine is literally running machine code, machine code, machine code, it doesn't know that you just made the machine code by sticking strings together, you know, or, or, or desperately like, you know, clawing bits out of the uh, compiled uh, uh, code. It doesn't care, right? It's, it's, uh, now, uh, What's the horrible unportable stuff? Well, uh, this is horribly unportable, and these numbers are unportable. But on ARM, you still got machine code. Yeah. So, uh, so V8 basically just has this. It has a little table saying like, if it's ARM, they're these long. If it's, uh, and it supports you know, uh, a couple of platforms. It, it, actually, if, if you got x86 and ARM. You have basically everything anyone is going to use except on servers. And if you add like a PowerPC and maybe a Spark, you pretty much have all the servers. And it's not really that awful to, you know, so you, you figure out some porting protocol. Like, I need to know the machine code to load a constant. I need to, you basically, actually, uh, QEMU began life. They wrote x86 interpreter with little functions. And then they just, because uh, there, there's 157 functions, they basically just disassembled it to figure out how many bytes were getting stuff done for each for your machine. Yeah? So, I mean, obviously the thing is, is that you're taking in another guy's instruction and yeah. you translate it. So if the compiler does something fancy here, like it sticks in a, you know, a, 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 like a stack canary or something, then you either have to work around what it's doing, skip over what it's doing with point arithmetic, yeah, and uh, the QEMU, they actually stopped doing this with QEMU because it was literally easier to write the assembly for each of the support architectures than to keep up to date with all the compiler stuff changing. I mean, so the, the, there's, if, if, instruct, if the instructions don't match up perfectly, you're going to wind up in a case where you're like, oh, okay, now I need to... And it, it, well, unfortunately, if uh, the way QEMU would report it's uh, an error with the compiler was by basically just sticking the wrong bytes together and then the virtual machine crashing some horrific and extremely difficult to debug fashion. Because in particular, like, you notice how we were doing debugging here, right? Like, let's just spit out that. And then you either need to, like, feed that out into a real disassembler or just get to the point where you don't need one anymore. I don't know which is worse. Is it that hard to feed it to a disassembler? I guess, uh, if, I guess you could write a binary file with that data and then do like an uh, and disassem has a binary input. But most disassemblers want to disassemble programs that have all this formatting stuff uh, around them. Ah, so the whole point of this was speed. Let's see what our speed's like. It's uh, probably awesome. Oh, 
there's there's net run running it a bunch to figure out how fast it is. So I should probably comment that out because that's probably dominating the runtime and it's making it hard to even find the, the performance number at the bottom. Shoot, let's see. So I'm going to make, uh, apparently I've done this before. Ah, so the, the performance of assemble the code, do the, uh, oh, memo line. Memline allocates a line memory and then mprotect. That's how I avoided the rounding thing last time, apparently. Ah, I'm at 3,000 nanoseconds to execute three instructions. That's slower than strings. Why? Well, because uh, you don't want to do this if you only need to code, run the code once. A, it's insanely complex. And B, it's uh, it's not that fast. You're doing a bunch of string manipulations. Wait, string manipulations are the slowest thing you can do. <laughs> the trick is, this can be crazy fast. So I've, I think I, I have an example. Uh, so essentially, you just split the thing off. So you uh, you compile it once, right? So jit it. You get some jitted code. Now you can run it, and you can run it efficiently, right? As long as you only jit it uh, one time. And, and uh, this is totally the case. If V8 has to run straight line through some JavaScript one time, it does not jit it. Because it's actually slower to carefully assemble machine code and then convince the CPU and the, the OS that it's okay to run it and then actually run it. Like, that's, uh, that's a huge net loss. Yeah. Is that really jitting them? Like just pre-compiling? Yeah, it, it actually... It, it, it's it's so it's it's a selectable JIT. Same deal with Java. Actually, same. So, so the JIT technique is usually selective, right? So it waits until you get to the loop where you're burning all your cycles. And and the trick is you, you basically you, you write a you know a fairly slow interpreter that just has a counter somewhere that says like how often we've been doing this. And if the how often we've been doing this is like a thousand, you're like I need to JIT this. So it'll take that loop, compile it to actual machine code, and then run it as actual machine code for however many iterations it needs, a million or a billion or, or whatever. And, uh, and, and then uh, the next time you've got to run that, it'll be insanely fast. In fact, it'll be as fast as compiled code, because it's compiled at this point. You just compiled it at runtime. So if, if you do that, then the performance is, in fact, good. So, uh, so here I have 10 operations. It compiles down to a six nanosecond function call, right? So that's uh, one one nanosecond to get in, and then it's half a nanosecond per add, which is like the speed of actual code because it's actually code. Does that make sense? That's something that feels kind of unholy about switching languages. In the yeah. So how? I mean, I, actually, it's it's widely recognized that like this sort of thing looks like mm, dark magic coming, and then you're like, wait. Those are not bytes. That BF is some sort of like it's marked with necromancy or something like it. Uh, <laughs> just permanent attribute of uh, sorry, character alignment's evil now. It's just, just the way it is. Nope, you can't reset it either. <laughs> I I don't know. I I think uh, having done this example in class time after time, it doesn't seem that evil to me. But it probably is like. This, this of course, deserves uh, some some sort of warning label around it, at least, because, like, yeah, if someone tries to compile this on ARM, this is not going to work at all, right? Somebody's going to have to really radically rethink how this is supposed to operate. I'm just imagining, you know, like, this program going along, and it's, you know, getting machine code, and then, like, all of a sudden, the thing above at one level switches the way it's interpreting, and then it starts mm -hmm. giving it different machine code. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still part of the same program, but like just the pathway to get to that machine code is different. It's kind of like surprising, yeah. honestly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and in particular, like the, the the fact that we're writing like what's obviously C plus plus with vectors and strings and such, and then that is literally a byte of machine code. <laughs> there's sort of just a there's a big mismatch on the uh, abstraction models there. Well, let's put it this way. It's like you're running Linux, and then suddenly, to get something done, it decides to boot up a Windows virtual machine, to get something done, and then close it off. And then it's say, hey, here's your result. I imagine a Linux kernel module that's like self-mod, and you're like, self-mod? And you can't figure out what the heck it's doing, and it's like, it's grabbing a soldering iron, and it's grabbing solder, and it's clipping wires. It's, is it upgrading the computer itself? Like, oh, ah, I don't expect a Linux kernel module to do that. In fact, that seems really like error prone and like I 
you know. And yes, it is like uh, computers can't solder for crap. <laughs> Shorting things together, and then of course the problem is then the computer has shorted itself. But if it works, this is an extremely powerful tactic. Look, there's a reason we tell you not to download the dev branch to work in progress. <laughs> uh, okay, I mean, I, I guess I mean, it makes sense. Like, you've you, you got, you got a way to turn, like, your, your, your higher level code is just human readable stuff. It all gets turned into machine code. You have one way of turning it into machine code, which is fast, but not, you know, amazingly fast. And then you have a high front end version, which you don't want to use very often, but, you know, at some point, the high front end version saves you something. That constant in terms of the calculation is so if, if you want to run Haskell, right? I mean, Haskell is a strongly typed, like, beautiful functional language where writing things is considered, like, pretty evil. Uh, you want to run Haskell fast. You need machine code that does whatever Haskell was supposed to do. It's exactly the same idea as sticking bytes together. So w when they were doing the Haskell interpreter and trying to make a jitted Haskell interpreter, they're like, ah, how do we do all of this, uh, uh, the byte manipulation? What do you use? Of course you use Haskell. I mean, if you're Haskelled enough that you really want to write a Haskell compiler to make it faster, you, you're going to want to do it in Haskell. So they do it in Haskell. So here you have, I mean, speaking of impedance mismatch, you have a functional language where everything is just sort of this glorious, beautiful, uh, side effect free stuff. And it's essentially prepared this, this enormous string. And the string becomes machine code that runs on the actual physical hardware that's then doing all of the stateful stuff that, uh, you know, that you, you, you know you, you, those low-level details should be relegated to the outer realms and to seal the, you know, whatever portal lets, uh, lets that contaminate your Haskell. Oh. Okay. Um, so, how similar does this feel to you to, uh, like, simulating a non-deterministic Turing machine on a SAT instance? Because that also has, to me, the same sort of impedance mismatch. They're both theoretical math, which is maybe maybe makes it all seem cleaner. Well, I mean, so one of these should roughly turn into machine code and polymer over time. Like, the, there's, the, there's mm. almost no way you want it in a case where an instruction to another instruction should take more than polymer over time. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I claim it's stronger than that. Actually, normally, normally these interpreters, like I, I take one instruction that I do in the simulated language, and I turn it into a little blob of machine code. So, and usually it's maybe a constant number of instructions per instructions of machine code per instruction of the source language, which means I have a linear time conversion. Right? Well, if, I if I make my program twice as long, my machine code gets twice as long. It takes twice as long to translate, but otherwise nothing really scales badly. And what if you have a lot of multiplies? You don't have a multiply conversion. Mm, you yeah, might, yeah. you, you sure. might, in yeah. theory, wind yeah. up a polynomial. Yeah. yeah. You, you try really hard. Yeah. Um, but a, a log factor. So, yeah. Uh, if uh, so, a, a lot of languages have an exponentiate operation, and if you don't have exponentiate in hardware, no one has exponentiate in hardware. You do multiplies, but you don't do a linear number of multiplies. You do a little log amount of multiplies. Anyways, so I mean, like this is very much like hey, let's go from one problem space to another problem space, and we can do it all in real time. So you know. somehow I never really noticed that 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 is what this entire class is about. Going from one problem space to another problem yeah. space. Yeah. Or so better. Uh, to, to, to me, like linear or log linear, like that, that to me is the real like threshold. Because if somebody says like, oh yeah, to make this line of output machine code, it just has to look at all the other lines of input, like that's a stupid algorithm. Like don't do it that way. That means if you make your input program twice as long, it's going to take four times as long to make the machine code. And, and you know, ten times as much code is going to be a hundred times as much uh, compute to get the machine code. That's just not, that's not the right thing. So anyways, where do we classify arbitrary machine code? Yeah, uh, so uh, you, you should be able to figure this out. Where where, uh, where does uh, x86 live in our hierarchy of uh, languages? Pretty sure I can decay x86 to a SAT instance, and I can do a problem in real time. I mean, I'm, I, I have to sit mm. down and prove it to actually you know, prove it properly, but I, I think I can. Yeah, yeah, so every operation you do in x86 can be converted to SAT. What does that tell you about the difficulty of x86? So, so if I can simulate uh, x86 on top of SAT, oh, uh, it, does that make x86 harder than SAT or is it easier than SAT? Well, at least, at least. Yeah. 
So uh, SAT is as powerful as x86. And then I can see that SAT on x86, so they are one and the same. <laughs> Turing, the church Turing thesis, right? They are equivalent, which, which is good. Uh, so uh, clearly we can simulate a Turing machine on x86. We've done it like 50 times in this class. Uh, can you simulate uh, an x86 on a Turing machine? <laughs> it's not going to be fast because the head is moving back and forth. Turing machines aren't fast. It's not what they're, it's not what they're built for. So, anyways, x86. So, okay, what, uh, so if you wanted to write the your last name theorem that shows that uh, x86 uh, is uh, simulatable on a Turing machine, how do you do it? Yeah, and uh, there aren't that many. In, there aren't that many bytes. So if you go to like sandpile.org, it actually has an opcode map for x86, and it's a relatively doable amount. So if you look at the like one byte opcodes, uh, and I want x64, which is not here. I thought there was a 64-bit equivalent somewhere in here. No, maybe not. So uh, x86. So Row zero, right? Zero zero is an ad. We got a whole row of ads. Got a whole row of ad with carries. Those are a waste of op codes, let me tell you. Uh, got a whole row of bitwise ands. Got a whole row of bitwise xors. Nothing too interesting happening here. We got some pushes. We have, uh, speaking of wasted instructions, uh, we have uh, decimal. Let's see. This is ASCII adjust for addition. This is divide ASCII adjust. These were designed for a pocket calculator that stores numbers in hex but does arithmetic like they were actually in decimal, binary code decimal. Totally useless ancient instructions. You, yeah, you can just uh, throw for those that's uh, uh, very rarely used. <laughs> yeah. We, we got a whole row of increments, uh, and then on, on uh, uh, in 64-bit mode, the four, right, four row was uh, turned into the rex prefix. Got a whole row of pushes, uh, got a, a, a fewer pops than pushes, a little weird. There's actually a prefix byte for the, the freaking segment register and the gosh darn more segments. Uh, and then an opera, uh, so the, the six, so for example, a six six is an operand size prefix. So you, you do a hex 66 to change the operand size. Got a row of jumps. Uh, we, we get a couple, so the, the, these are annoying because there's actually sub instructions hanging off of those. Test and exchange. This is just exchange, another wasted row, like you don't need why are those as one byte instructions? There's some useful moves, actually two rows of moves. We've been using the B moves, right? Move AL and then uh, uh, move, move AX. Get like return at the C3, right? No, no problem. A uh, couple more sub things to work on. Like uh, it's, it's a lot of work, but there's, it's honestly not really that intellectually challenging. Like you figure out what a C3 does, you do it in the simulator, like, yep, there you go. Once you get all the bytes, you run a program, and then you discover the undocumented opcodes that the program's actually using. Uh, actually, sand, sand piles should be good, because that'll, uh, that'll actually have them. Uh, and uh, basically, like, uh, you know, a month later. So this is what we get on the for, right? Yeah. So conceptually, there's actually no problem here, right? You just take each piece, you figure out how to translate it on the, you know, the new machine. That's, that's it. You're done. Yeah, but once you've done all the pieces, there are a lot of pieces. But e each piece is—I mean, these are literally just bytes sitting in memory. You can—you uh, know—you can test it out by hard coding bytes of machine code. You can—I uh, mean, t t to me, this—the fact that there's this string that makes the machine do anything the machine is capable of doing—that that, kind of seems like the fundamental, like, uh, magic. Questions? Do you uh, do you think you would write a uh, a jitted interpreter? There's actually probably a better way to do this. Honestly, I, th I think calling compiler is probably the right way to do it nowadays. Th th there are jitting libraries where you basically like say, "I want machine code to do this, that, and the other thing," and then call those library functions, and then it spits out the uh, for, for the appropriate uh, machine you're on. And it, it, you know, it works on x86 and ARM and Spark and uh, PowerPC. Um, probably, uh, I, I feel like I'd be far more inclined to make the translator to translate into a language that I know is already has the problem solved. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, unless unless yeah. there's a really bad overhead somewhere. Really nice. 
Because like I've seen yeah. that, like there's the people yeah. who are like, oh yeah, like to do our project we needed uh, <laughs> features in this language, but we're only able to compile mm -hmm. this language, so we made a translator from that language to this other language, oh, and now ooh. we use them side by side all the time, because why not? <laughs> yeah, it's a su super common. And, uh, and I mean, it, it's super common not only in uh, uh, computer science practice, but also in the theory, right? That is, we, we made this bizarre graph of translations between these NP-complete problems just because that's the natural way to solve this kind of problem, right? You, you, uh, you have a bunch of graph things, so you're like, oh, I need to figure out how to transform graph things in the uh, arbitrary NP-complete problems into graph operations. That's hard to do direct. So you figure out some series of libraries or existing stuff that uh, you can use. Cook Levin being the big, uh, the big library everybody uses for this. Questions? Homework? <laughs> I need to give you homework on that. I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll figure out. A, I'll figure out a homework for, uh, for for doing that. I think the project you get like two weeks before uh, the midterm and uh, the next uh, stuff. Oh, mid, mid, midterm. And it's still two weeks. T two weeks from today is the midterm. Are we doing in class for the midterm? Or? That is my plan, yes. No, actually, I have to start with 